On the 6th of July, the official Elden Ring website updated with a new description. It reads as follows. The Golden Order has been shattered. Throughout the lands between, demigods holding shards of the Elden Ring squabble and make war over the ruins of a perfect realm, now abandoned by the golden guidance of the Greater Will. As the echoes of this cotton flicked thunder in the distance, an outcast arrives. Once, their ancestors called the lands between home, but the blessed light of grace was lost to their tribe long ago, and they were expelled from the kingdom. They are the tarnished, and they have returned to claim the Elden Lordship promised to them by legend. Those few inhabitants who are not mad or hostile linger near the broken remnants of cities left behind by the shattering. They may have answers for you if you help them. Above them all, ensconced in legacies bristling with traps, secrets, and guardians, the demigods, warped lords who began as members of a royal and noble family, rule their domains with the unyielding power granted by shards of the Elden Ring. This is probably all the story we're going to get until Gamescom at the end of August, and combined with everything else, it's actually a ton to go over, so I've shattered it all into eight sections. Let's get into it, starting with the character that they seem to be building up as the main antagonist of Elden Ring. Her name is Queen Marika, the Eternal. She's first mentioned on the official site, which reads, In the lands between, ruled by Queen Marika the Eternal, the Elden Ring, the source of the Erd Tree, has been shattered. Marika's offspring, demigods all, claimed the shards of the Elden Ring known as the Great Runes, and the mad taint of their newfound strength triggered a war. So the Japanese word that they use for eternal is actually the same one they used to describe the perpetuity of the everlasting dragons in Dark Souls, so she likely has a sort of immortality akin to them. Her offspring are demigods, after all, so it would make some sense that she is a sort of deity. Now, it still is possible that Marika is innocent in all of this, and that her offspring alone are responsible for the shattering. That said, a Russian site calls her the Mistress of the Coveted Ring, which I think suggests she has claimed at least some of its power, and assuming that she's still the ruler of the Lands Between, it is at least being implied that she has benefited from, and played a part in, the Ring's shattering. So from what I can tell so far, the reasons for shattering the ring might be A, to claim its power, but also B, to upset the world order and sort of inspire chaos. Because despite Marika quote-unquote ruling the lands between, her demigod offspring are actually squabbling with one another, and they're making war. It doesn't exactly show that she's got control of them, or that she even wants to stop them making war. It seems like each demigod has a chunk of the open world under their dominion, almost like a country. According to an interview with Miyazaki, each demigod can be found at the end of legacy dungeons, and since there is one legacy dungeon per open world, that means yeah, each demigod likely has a chunk of this open world to themselves. This sort of drama between kingdoms is exactly what you'd expect from George R. R. Martin's writing, and since we're expected to delve into the complex, bloody history of the Shattering, I expect there to be a ton of lore behind each demigod and kingdom. A large part of the designs of these major characters will be how they were twisted by claiming shards of the Elden Ring. According to Miyazaki, they each inherited a different power or element, so to speak, and each was twisted and warped in its own way, and it brought a tainted strength to each of them. They each fell to madness and fell to ruin in their own individual ways, so while there is heroic and mythological elements to them, they are also going to have this very mad taint and this deep-seated ruin. And it seems like one such lord has already been revealed to us. Uh, this heavily armed boss is referenced in a tweet from June 24th, which reads, A lord clings to his ruined legacy, the ruler of a husk wrung dry by war. And while I guess it's possible that he's a lord from the world before the Shattering, clinging to his ruined legacy, it's still more likely to me that he's a demigod, since he's a perfect example of a character that looks tainted and ruined by the Elden Ring. And you have to wonder, did any of them, including Marika, expect the Elden Ring to twist and taint them in such a way? Do they even care? According to the official site, the shards of the Elden Ring are called Great Runes, 
So runes are simply a type of Nordic alphabet, but in fantasy writing they're often used as words of magical power. Together, it seems, these runes spell the Elden Ring, but since the Elden Ring has been shattered alone, some of these runes have been claimed. A long, long time ago, the earliest leak about Elden Ring actually revealed the game was once called Great Rune and it was said to be a game about traveling to distant kingdoms and claiming the power that lies there. Therefore, I wonder if defeating a demigod might allow you to claim their power or their rune in some way, perhaps getting a specific ability or type of power-up? According to the trailer, the Elden Ring is a weapon, after all. Listen. Brandish the Elden Ring. They're doing such a good job with the concept of the Elden Ring, because even though we kind of know so much about it, it's still hard to pin down exactly what it is. It's made up of runes, which makes it literal, it gives order to the world, making it seem conceptual, and yet it's also physical, it's able to be hammered and shattered into pieces. Actually, one really awesome discovery I saw recently was how similar the shattering scene with the blacksmith is to this Forging the Ring concept art by Alan Lee, who has done a ton of official artwork for Tolkien's Lord of the Rings series. Uh, I believe this is Sauron forging the One Ring. And like the One Ring, the Elden Ring also has text upon it. It's also a weapon of great power and Perhaps most importantly, it also has a will associated with it. According to the official site, when the demigods triggered the Shattering War, they were abandoned by the Greater Will. Now, somehow, this Greater Will persists despite the ring being shattered, and has decided that these demigods, who were once members of a royal and noble family, are no longer worthy of its favor. Instead, it seems, this favor has been returned to us instead, the Tarnished. According to Miyazaki, you could call them Tarnished individuals who have lost grace, and this was a long time preceding the setting of the game, a long time before. The ancestors of the characters that are present in the world were banished and exiled from the lands between these Tarnished. Then, a long time after that, the Elden Ring was shattered in a historical event. This triggers the return of this lost grace, and it calls out to the Tarnished, who were once exiled from the lands between, and it guides them back. So this is the starting point, or the impetus for the game itself, the Tarnished being called by the lost grace, and returning to the lands between. The Tarnished sound a lot like the Unkindled from Dark Souls 3, in the sense that they were also deemed unworthy a long time ago, but now are being called back, almost as a last resort. It's a chance to redeem ourselves, but don't you guys also think that it kind of feels a bit insulting? Like, oh, now you need us, you know? Miyazaki does go on to say, I feel like one of the main themes of the game is how the player, the Tarnished, approaches or treats this newfound grace and this return to the land that they were once banished from, how they interpret this and the meaning. It's not just the player character, of course, it's lots of characters in the game who are all beckoned back and will have their own adventures and motives. We want the player to discover for themselves what that means and how they want to begin their adventure. In Dark Souls 3, we stood before the soul of Cinder itself, and we had the choice to take its place and restore the current world order. As Unkindled Ash, this is kind of our logical goal, but after you see what happened to all the other Lords of Cinder, you are supposed to realize that being a Lord of Cinder is a very sacrificial, subservient role. Similarly, the goal for our Tarnished is to stand before the Elden Ring and become a, quote, Elden Lord. and. You know, while that sounds like a real power fantasy title, I'm sure in reality it won't be as great as it sounds. The shards of the Elden Ring have twisted the demigods, after all, and imagine what its full power might do to us, a Tarnished. And the word Tarnished is just such a wonderful term for these characters, because when a metal is Tarnished, it means it's lost its luster. Similarly, we've lost our Golden Grace, and specifically this Golden Grace was once found in our eyes. 
Miyazaki says, The lands between are blessed by the presence of the Elden Ring and by the Erd Tree, which symbolizes its presence, and this has given grace or blessing to the people throughout the land, great and small. What this represents in them is a sort of golden light or a golden aura that is specifically shown in their eyes, and this symbolizes the blessing or the grace of the Erd Tree. However, after a time, there were some individuals who lost this grace and the light faded from their eyes. And these are what are known as the Tarnished. Also, if this boss is indeed a demigod, then unsurprisingly, you know, he no longer has golden eyes. Interesting then that he speaks down to us. It's like, man, I don't see any golden grace in your eyes either. So whatever sin the Tarnished committed ages ago must set us apart. And even though we've apparently regained some of that grace, our golden light doesn't seem to have returned to our eyes either, so all we've been able to do is just return to the lands between for now. To get to the lands between, you apparently have to traverse the foggy sea. Since we know the lands between are an open world, and that's where most of the game takes place, I bet traversing this sea of fog is a sort of tutorial level. Developers have to control your experience at the start of the game, right? They have to teach you the ropes, like the journey to the Nexus in Demon Souls, or escaping from the Asylum in Dark Souls, and once you've made it through this section, you're on your own. And you're free to go and die in the catacombs, so to speak. The lands between, or the Rift Lands, as they've been called, are the ruins of a perfect realm, now ruled by Queen Marika. Remember the Things Betwixt area at the start of Dark Souls 2? It uses the same Japanese word that roughly translates to interspace in its name, and so does the Lands Between, so maybe these two places are comparable in some way? The question is, the Lands Between what? Above, obviously, is the higher plane, marked by the light beyond the Erd Tree, but then what is below? Earth? Hell? We are considered dead beings, after all. Maybe that's where we come from? Alternatively, there are a lot of spirits in the Lands Between, like our horse, so maybe the Lands Between are a world where creatures have one foot in the mortal realm and one in the divine. It's hard to say for sure. At any rate, the Lands Between are really intertwined, and they appear to be actually like layered on top of one another around the Erd Tree. Proof of this is seen in this snowy world, where we are significantly closer to the top of the tree than in the other scenes, where you could even see the higher plains in the distance. According to this tweet from June 15th, our path reaches up to the branches of the heavens and twists down to the roots of the earth. I love the order to all of these concepts, you know. Starting at the top, there is the Greater Will, which sounds akin to a god, capable of being incredibly benevolent, blessing the land, and also incredibly vindictive, exiling those who displease it. It's probably responsible for the Golden Order of the World, the Japanese word for which translates to commandment or law. And then, for lack of a better word, the Greater Will is aligned with the Elden Ring, as it has clearly taken offense to its shattering. The Elden Ring is at the heart of the Erd Tree, and the pure light beyond the Erd Tree filters down through its branches and is called the Guidance of Grace, or the Grace of Gold. This gold manifests upon the lands between as pockets of lost grace, which act as checkpoints to guide the player, and this grace manifests within characters as golden eyes. See what I mean? There's a lot there. Now, originally, I thought our character was marked as a tarnished by their grey hair, but in my comment section, Bandai Namco actually clarified that in the lands between, a tarnished is not marked by the loss of the colour red, but of another colour. Now we know that colour is gold. But the question remains, who are the red-haired race of beings, namely this giant and this Valkyrie? The big war we know about is the Shattering War, and I'd bet that that's what we're witnessing here, because of this scene where a soldier strikes this giant right at the moment we're presented with the ring shattering. Therefore, you'd think the red-haired race would be enemies of the demigods like we are, so why then does the Valkyrie impale us? Is the sin our tarnished ancestors committed ages ago so terrible that they're hated by literally everyone? Even the enemy of our enemy, maybe. This is a random note, but in the last video, I thought you could see a bit of red inside the new Firekeeper's hood. However, there's been a bit of debate on the Reddit regarding whether it's actually red or a trick of the light, since it appears more golden in this scene. 
It would certainly be interesting if she was one of the red-haired race, but we'll have to wait and see. Speaking of red-haired characters, one of my favourite fantasy stories of all time is The Name of the Wind by Patrick Rothfuss, and it features a protagonist known for his fiery red hair. Okay, he's actually known for a bit more than that. Let me pull up this excerpt from Audible, and I'll let him explain. I have stolen princesses back from sleeping Barrow Kings. I burned down the town of Trebon. I have spent the night with Velurian and left with both my sanity and my life. I was expelled from the university at a younger age than most people are allowed in. I tread paths by moonlight that others fear to speak of during day. I have talked to gods, loved women, and written songs that make the minstrels weep. You may have heard of me. This is an audiobook you can listen to for free during your 30-day Audible trial. So go and visit audible.com slash vartividya or text vartividya to 500-500 to start your free trial right now. The Name of the Wind is a three-part series, and it seems like the third novel might never come out at this point, but hey, that makes it a perfect recommendation for Elden Ring fans, right? I know how much you guys love waiting. Seriously though, the author is actually fantastic, especially at intriguing the reader with all sorts of questions about the story, while also hiding the answers to that story all throughout the series. It's kind of like what Souls does with its lore, honestly. Um, it's one of my favorite stories of all time, really, and I know a lot of people in the comments can vouch for The Name of the Wind being amazing as well. So again, go and visit audible.com slash vartividya or text vartividya to 500-500 to get started today. Thank you to Audible for sponsoring this video, and thank you, as always, for watching.